Hi, Billy Goodnick here, local landscape architect and lover of ducks. Welcome to GardenWise, the place where all the cool kids come to learn about sustainable landscaping. You know, there's a saying in the world of design, whether we're talking about architecture or smartphones or landscape design, it's form follows function. In other words, what it looks like, its form, is secondary to how it works. You wouldn't want a chair that has a seat at a 45 degree angle, no matter how nice it looks. Well, one of the things landscape architects and landscape designers do is think about function as well as just making your garden drop dead gorgeous and sustainable. So we're going to talk to another landscape architect, we've been doing this series for a while, and learn from Jack Kiesel how he goes about designing a landscape for his clients. Stay tuned. Hi, we're going to talk to another designer today. The whole purpose of these segments is to warm you up to the idea that maybe you need a designer in your project. Not every project needs it. Some of them are fine DIY, uh, but there's a point at which we need some professional help. So I'm here with Jack Kiesel. Um, your Kiesel Design, Kiesel. Yep, Kiesel Design. That's okay. it. You design Kiesels. <laughs> so if you need any Kiesels, he's the guy to call. Exactly. Um, I've known you for years and years, but I don't know that I've ever gotten back into your origin story. So what, what was your first brush with plants? What opened the door to what you're doing now? I think kind of, I, I grew up as a hippie child in Cambria, and uh, I was introduced to kind of gardening by this, this one guy. He was um, quite, quite the character, kind of got me into that. And then also I developed a real appreciation for the natural beauty of Cambria with the pine trees, the ocean. Yeah. Spent a lot of time in the creeks when I was a little kid, and through that I really started paying attention to you know plants and animals and whatnot. Um, and that then I also did art. Art was also a big part of my growing up. I was surrounded by a lot of artists oh, too. Wonder, yeah, Cambridge. And right, and so I you know when I was grounded, I just draw all the time. <laughs> you know? Were you grounded yeah, yeah, often? Yeah, I, I was. Yeah, when I was grounded, yeah, yeah probably. A little more than uh, some kids, <laughs> less than others, I guess. Why but, am I not surprised? <laughs> but, you know, taking that, so that interest in art and science, I kind of was looking around and landscape architecture seemed to be a really good fit for that. So when you were six years old, you became a landscape architect? Yeah, in, in a way, yeah. <laughs> so, Jack, I got your plan here. Uh, we're going to put it up on the screen. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, the different rooms, uh, the spaces, the activity areas. So up here, uh, we're right along the back of the house. Right here, we've got what kind of uses? Well, this patio here, um, we created some wood stoops, as they were, as they are. To, stoops, I love that. Yeah, to, to come out and, because there's kind of a, there's quite a bit of grade difference here, so that's taken up by these wood steps. Okay, uh, two steps generous. down. Um, and then you come down here in this terrace, and then this is a combination kind of dining and entertaining, which we have here, obviously, the table. And this? And, and the fireplace. So this okay. is like your kind of evening kind of hangout spot. Social activities. Also, you get some great views, obviously, of the mountains and everything here. Kind of view, dining, um, and, and just basic uh, lounge terrace. Got it. And then over here, this looks like uh, this extra building here. Yeah, that's, that's an office. That's a, a, in the home office at this point. And it's got a nice little space out around Correct. it and a, and a little deck there. Mm -hmm. So then we come down the steps, and uh, this is just a planted slope, and we come to, no guilt trip here, you got a lawn. Correct, we have a lawn. People don't go to hell just for having a lawn, right? But no. what goes along with? Um, well, what goes along with that lawn? Well, if, when you, can, if you can justify the lawn, I, 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 we look at it as being okay because... In this situation, we have a very active family with teenage kids, mm -hmm. and they have a dog, and it's right next to the pool, and they're down here pretty much every day, so they're playing catch, they're running the dog. Um, we had a more of a drought-tolerant California native lawn, mm. and uh, just the, the, the amount of use they were getting out of it was probably was a little more than we had anticipated, so then we had to go with a more traditional lawn that could really kind of take that, that Got it. abuse. So. And then we've got a nice big pool here, mm -hmm. and uh, that, that's great. And then you've got also some areas down in here for hanging out near the pool. Start with the things you're going to use, things that are going to enhance your life. Um, the same way if you love cooking, you put a little extra money into your kitchen, that it's worth the extra expense in a landscape 
to be able to use it functionally and, and have it be a, an expansion of your lifestyle. And it sounds like that's what you did with the pool. Correct. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this little pattern down here. It looks like uh, rock or boulders or that sort of thing. That's doing what? Yeah, so this is a, this is a drainage feature. So it's basically a bioswell that runs along the edge here. Um, you know, as every, every designer you wanna, one of the first things you look at is the, the drainage, you know, mm -hmm. and you wanna make sure that you're responsible as much as possible for all the on-site drainage here, literally on site. So that's what this is doing. It's allowing that water to infiltrate over time and to reduce any overflows to the, to the neighbors. You know, we wanna be good neighbors. Excellent. Um, got the big picture. Well, it's a complicated set of plans, more than I ever do, uh, and uh, I'm pretty sure you don't just stay up 24 hours and produce this yourself. So let's talk a little bit about how you get from what we talked about, client interview, to really being able to create the details and, and who's part of that whole process. So why don't we start over here. Uh, love this bench. Um, simple, but the dark wood and all that. What kind of materials are here and how did you get to them? Yeah, well, this is a, a Ipe hardwood, and so it has a really good rot resistance, mm -hmm. very dense wood, um, uh, more rot, rot, rot resistant even than redwood, for example. And so, yeah, that's what it, it's, it's a really great bench. They love it. It's a, it's a custom feature. Stacy Isaac, who I work with and collaborate with on this project, uh, Stacy Isaac Design, she was a huge part of this whole garden. Couldn't have happened without her. And she was the one who basically designed this. So uh, material selection and then being able to explain to the person who's going to hold the hammer how you put all this stuff together. That all falls to people like Stacy and... Yeah, well, we do the, the detailed drawings, figure out how it's going to get fabricated. Then we make sure we bring in the right people to do the work. Right. Um, love the, the fireplace. It's just so simple. Um, Tell me a little bit more uh, about it. What are we looking at in here? How they how we get them built? Yeah, so this is a, a, a gas custom fireplace with board form exterior. So that means they're, Facing, they're just I laying up wood boards yes. and pouring inside it. And um, we look at this landscape as kind of a California Mediterranean contemporary type of style. And uh, with that style, you, you often see these kind of board form textures brought in into the, the, the landscape. It's also works well. They used, used to use it traditionally in, in, as well. The board oh, cool. Form I, I love this planting design. It's a mix of plants. I don't know that I would have come up with and, and Stacy's hand shows here, but this mix of some California natives. We've got, uh, looks like deer grass and uh, manzanitas, and then d just this wonderful mix of things. What was here before, um, before this planting showed up? Well, what was here before is they had some uh, olive trees that were here. Actually, one of those trees, I think we did relocate it right there. And um, so what the problem with those trees too was, if you look at the existing photos, it was really blocking the views mm. and just not much was growing under it. So in order to, open the, the yard, the landscape up to the views. And so people can see, hey, there's something over here you might want to, you know, visit. Right. Um, so we took those trees out and re-terraced this, put in all new steps. This used to be a brick patio, which was very uneven in mm. surface. Brick will much do that smaller, after yeah, time. Than is now. There's also a pergola that they had over here that was very low. So you, you really felt like you're almost going to hit your head. Mm on the thing and so that was taken out and that really helped that's why other umbrellas maybe at a future point in time they might reintroduce another pergola but that remains to be seen and the plants looks like everything is super low water use um and uh, a very as structured as the patio is everything's on these grids this is this is just got a very loose kind of wild feel and i think you talked about uh this being more formal and the wildness that we have down here Correct. Yeah, we wanted to kind of create, you know, soft, soft feeling of softness and so, kind of soften the edges. Like the grasses. As it were. And I think the chandra pedalum and then the grasses help do that. Also introducing some plants in between the joints here and there. Right. Also kind of transitions what we talked about earlier between that kind of really hard surface to the more soft areas. Mm -hmm. So that, that really helps. And then 
combination of the, the blue colored senecios help to pop the succulents. And then the gravels are also nice because they're low maintenance. You can also walk on it if you, if you need to. Yeah, what I'm, what I'm seeing here, and this is something that uh, I, I think is key for professionals, um, is there's echoes of similar types of plants. We've got agave and aloe, which have the same sort of structure. We're using silvers and grayish colors together, and there's just a very harmonious feel in here, and yet there's a lot of diversity to it. And, and uh, Hats off to the, the final planting design. Last thing I want to um, talk about is the uh, bioswale and the, uh, the gravel area that you have down here that carries all the drainage water and lets it sink in. So why don't we head over that away? So Jack, wrapping up, this is actually a nice place to wrap up this segment because when everything's all done, uh, all the water, all the runoff, everything ends up here. This is kind of like the, the last paragraph uh, in the story here. So what are we looking at here and why do we have something like this? Uh, it's just beautiful. I just love the wildness of it. But what do you call something like this, these areas of, of gravel, kind of like a stream bed? Well, it's basically we call this like a bioswale uh, or, you know, infiltration swale is another uh, term that is often used. And per the city, you're, we're kind of required, um, especially any kind of larger uh, redevelopments or new development to be responsible for all the on-site stormwater and that's what this is doing it's taking all the water from the upper terraces moving it through here and then again infiltrating on site as much as possible so in principle we're not only keeping this owner's water from becoming a, a nuisance but we're also recharging groundwater here and i guess in some cases though not here we're keeping it from going to the street going down the gutters, going out into the creeks. Yeah, and then, you know, we always try to introduce these these as not just a utilitary, utility type feature, but it's actually something that can be very beautiful at the same time. So well, it's, it is. it's doing a, a number of things here. So we have the, the gravel, right, in the lower areas, so you're keeping that clear so the water can go right in. And then with plants like these carrots and whatnot, and then the chondropellum that can handle intermittent inundation, and so that's why you see these. And then as you get further out, you get more drier plants. Um, and we're putting some stuff in here with the grasses. So you get some color every once in a while. You'll have a aloe or, or whatnot in there or the leucodendrons. And it really kind of gives a, gives a real lot of body to the feature. Yeah, it's like you've, you've got uh, what I call muscle plants, things that just yes. have a real presence. And then in between is all the finery. So it's a, it's a wonderful contrast of similar forms, uh, but doing them in all different textures and foliage size and things like that. Yeah, uh, yeah uh, this, this is very popular, especially with contemporary, to do this kind of mix of, of grasses and succulents and, and, you know, kind of colorful shrubs like this. And, and the beautiful thing about these leucodendrons, I know you like to use these, Billy, is that they, um, they do give you all year round color. And that's another part we want to do with this garden is to make, all, you know, interest all year round. Yeah, well, that's key. Flowers are fleeting. Yes. And structure and foliage color and contrast like this are, are there all around. Uh, I want to thank you for the time. It's a great project. Uh, I wish I could say I'd be stealing some ideas from you, but <laughs> I don't work at this scale. So thanks for spending your time, and thanks right. to Stacy for all the work that she put in on this project. And uh, when in need, look for a professional designer. Bring them into your project. Thank you, Billy. Thank you. See, I told you Jack would be really informative. If you want to learn more about his services or just look at his beautiful designs, go to his website, kieseldesign.com. Now we're heading out to the wilds of Goleta, actually just a few blocks from my house. And we're going to what you might have known as Knapp Nursery. It's now Paradise Farm. It's owned by uh, Celeste and Patrick Burns. And Patrick has all the expertise you need about buying fruit trees. Want to pick some fresh fruit? for your uh, breakfast, that's the place to go to learn how to grow them. Spoiler alert, three words, build your soil. Let's talk to Patrick. Hi, I'm at Paradise Farm in Goleta. You may have known it as Knapp Nursery uh, for decades and decades. It's under new ownership. And I'm here to talk about fruit trees. Uh, as a designer, I'm often asked by my clients, should I grow any fruit trees? What kind should I grow? How do I grow them? 
I know a good amount about it, but I'm here with a, a uh, expert today. I'm gonna talk to Pat Burns about growing fruit trees, how to pick them, how to care for them, what's a day in the life. So let's go talk to Patrick, see what he's got to say. Pat. Yes, sir. Thanks for being on the show. I met you a month or so ago when we started talking about doing this segment and your excitement about fruit trees was contagious and it went beyond just biting into a plum and having a drip on your shirt. What is it about fruit trees that gets you? Uh, besides the, the fact that you get to go out into your own yard and pick some fruit and eat it, it's one of those things, uh, one of the few things that we can do individually to kind of alleviate a lot of the ills that are facing our society. Such uh, as? You know, income inequality, taking fruit from your own yard and sharing it with neighbors. Wonderful. It's a great, it's not a, it doesn't solve the problem, but it just kind of alleviates it. Uh, getting to know your neighbors, uh, reducing our carbon footprints. You know, you don't need to order blueberries from Chile in December because you're growing them at your house. Yeah. Uh, that type of thing. Um, so I'm going to put myself in the position of my design clients. I know a good amount about plants and fruit trees and things, but I'm often asked by uh, my clients who are designing a new landscape or rehabbing a landscape about where do fruit trees fit in. And uh, one of the first questions, and it's, it's kind of silly, they come to me and they say, what should I grow? And you know, my answer is, what are you going to eat? eat? Yeah. But how do you deal with... Uh, with helping people select. They walk in here on a Saturday morning, yeah, that's their one of coffee the in their hand, and they go, tell me about fruit trees. How yeah. did you start that conversation with them? Yeah, that's the first question I ask. What are you gonna, what do you eat? And if you have children, what do you want them to eat? Uh, kids love to go outside and pick fruit and eat it. It's just a, it's a natural thing to do. and couldn't be more organic or uh, better for them, that, you know, that type of thing. So what do you eat? And then the, be the really, beautiful thing about living in Santa Barbara is you can grow almost anything here. There's a, a neighbor around the corner from us that grows mangoes. So, and there's bananas and all that stuff. We don't, we carry mostly stone fruits, citrus, and avocados. The exotics uh, come and go as they're available, but uh, yeah, Santa Barbara is a great place to grow things. So let's start with that. Uh, you mentioned stone fruits, and that I guess encompasses all the deciduous things, not literally stone fruits, things like apples, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, how, do the, how do those differ from the other categories you talked about, um, citrus, avocados, and things? There's a, there's a huge difference between how those two types of plants grow or what they look like yeah. through the year. Yeah, the subtropical avocados and citrus trees uh, tend to live a long time and are slow growing and they're, uh, they're, they don't lose their leaves. They produce ah. greenery and they have their cycles that are year round, whereas uh, stone fruits go dormant. So and stone fruits, for example. Apricots, a apples, peaches. Things with a pit you don't want to bite on. Right. right. And those are deciduous trees. They, they lose all their leaves. They go dormant for a certain short period in Santa Barbara. Mm -hmm. uh, Which then, we'd like to be longer. And then they come back and they require a lot more pruning. Uh -huh. uh, pruning is very important with stone fruits. It's not uh, critical with citrus and avocados, but with stone fruit, you really want to keep the, the roots and the canopy, the two sections of the tree in balance. So a lot of the stone fruits can be grown in containers mm. and put on your patio because you can control the balance of the two sections of the tree right. but through pruning. So after the tree is fruiting in the summertime, you prune it the way you want to keep it for the rest of the year. So you're, uh, yeah, the, the way I describe it to people is you've got a certain amount of biomass above ground. It's right. being supported by a proportionate amount of roots yeah, and like biomass. Yeah, like a, a mirror image It's like the, the theory of bonsai. You have a hundred year old pine tree that's only this big. It's growing in this much soil. So you just keep Yeah, that's amazing the way yeah. people get that done. As lovely as these square mm -hmm. wooden boxes are, they're <laughs> not exactly going to put you on the cover of no. a fine gardening magazine. Mm -hmm. Other options or um, ways of, of putting these out and still having them feel like an amenity yeah. in the garden? Any container will, get, will do, except you got to be aware that after a few years, you're going to have to refresh the soil. 
And so if you have yes. a, a big stone container with a lip on it, it makes it really difficult <laughs> to pull, pull it out. out. Yeah. Right. So it's got to be smooth sided and have uh, relatively easy access and preferably to the wider bottom. at the top. Yeah. So we're, we're back to uh, bonsai, the basic principle in bonsai, the way you can keep a plant in the same container for dozens of years is you once in a while when it's eaten up all the soil or used up all mm -hmm. of it and there's a big root mass. So you would be trimming the top back a little bit, reduce the biomass, yep. trimming the roots back a little bit, putting it back in fresh soil, same size container. Yep. You don't have to keep shopping up. Yeah. I like that. Um, what else do I want to know about growing stuff in containers? How do I, or just in general, what about watering? Uh, you got to get to know your soil because every location is different. Our, this soil is it, where we're standing is different than it is 200 yards away. Right. So you got to get to know your soil. Grab a handful after you water it and see how many days it takes for it to not clump together. So you and we're talking about going down a few inches. Yeah, get don't a just shovel. yeah, just don't scrape just, the stuff right. off the top. Get down a little bit. Grab a, a handful and clump it together. If it stays together, it's still moist. Mm -hmm. And don't add water until it. It right. falls apart in your hand. So expectations. Uh, I, I come here in February. I buy a bare root fruit tree. January. January, excuse yeah. me. Yeah. Um, I, I, I do all the right things, which you're going to tell me about. And then I go in the house um, and I start toasting some bread because in about five minutes, I'm going to have some beautiful peaches, right? Nope. Three no. or four okay. years. Yeah. Three to four years. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Lower expectations. Yeah. There are some varieties that go faster. Uh, and there's some precocious trees that'll start producing sooner, and you just get lucky and you get those trees. That's great. Would you take the fruit off just so it conserves some energy, or not a big deal? I don't think it's a big deal. Because yeah. I'm doing that right now with my tomatoes. I keep picking the flowers yeah. off until they get yeah. big enough to that support works. them. That uh, works. Or plant another tomato, the way I look at it. Okay. Uh, if you want to get more, just plant another tomato. But the, the, the core issue is to control your tree, keep it in balance with pruning. I can't emphasize that enough. Prune your fruit trees, be religious about it, yeah. and get aggressive with it, and make it a, a thing that you but do. But there, there's a right way, I know, and I don't know what it is. There's yeah. a right way to prune specific types. You might prune a peach differently than you prune a plum. Yeah. Uh, we're not going to be able to go over that here, mm -hmm. so what resources would you send somebody to to learn more about the specifics? It's not hard. It's easy, and... Uh, Look at the best resource probably in the world is Dave Wilson's nursery. Ah. Uh, those guys are experts, Tom Spellman. Uh, they have all the literature, and we can certainly share that with anybody that, Great. that comes Okay, in. let's move forward a little bit. My client has put some fruit trees in, and they're doing something, but they want to know what else they need to do. So a year in the life of an established fruit tree. Let's talk a little about how you water them. Do they need to be mulched? Uh, we hear a lot about sprays and fungicides mm -hmm. and going organic and pests and things like that. Uh, I know it's less complicated than uh, having a saltwater fish tank. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it's a little more complicated than having a pet rock. So what's a... Pay attention to your tree. See what it's doing. It'll tell you if it's, uh, if it's you know... Uh, if it's drooping, Wilting, yeah. Yeah, it needs water. If, uh, if it's getting discolored, it, there's certain reasons for that. I don't want to get into all the weeds, but... Uh, um, and the weeds. Yeah, and <laughs> keep, keep the weeds it clean. Down. Yeah, exactly. Um, and there's remedies for all this stuff. So yeah. if, so, if, if the, some mystery pops up and somebody looks at their plant and they go, this just doesn't look right, uh, is it enough to take a few photos or grab a couple leaf samples, bring them in, do a little diagnosing? Yeah, yeah, I, I would say just be patient with it. The trees are very resilient. Um, I, unless it's a big major problem, don't don't worry about it. Let nature take care yeah, of it. Yeah, it, it'll be fine. Uh, you need to be uh, religious about fertilizing it twice a year. Pick your dates. Like, so it's easy to remember, ah. June 1st, January 1st. And what kind of June fertilizer? June 1st, it's... January a balanced, organic um, citrus or fruit tree uh, fertilizer. So uh, I've sent my clients in here. You've educated them. You've helped them pick out a tree. Um, I'm no use on this. How do they put it in the ground? What do they do in terms of how big a hole, what you mix with it? If there's any incantations you have to do or wait for star alignments. Um, soils, how do we get them started? Soils, everything. Uh, put a 
It's what is the, it? Put a, t a $1 plant in a $10 hole? Is that the... Yeah, okay. yeah, stuff like that. And really invest in your soil. But that's true for everything that we're growing at home. You know, build healthy soil first. And what healthy? Constantly. Tell me about healthy. Organ use organics and and often amend it. Don't just do it once and expect it to last for mm. 10 years. Do a little bit every season and let it build over time because what you're trying to do is build the the, the ecosystem underground right. that will take over. A living web. Right. You right. won't and then down the road you won't even know that you're doing it and it's and your but things are thriving. Doesn't that mean there might be bugs in your soil? Is thousands, that thousands oh, per okay, handful. We want that. Yeah, we want that. So uh, you've got a bag here, it's called Soil Booster. Yeah, this is a soil conditioner. It's uh, meant to be used as a 50-50 mix with your native soil. So I'm going to be here with a shovel. I'm going to pour some of this out. I'm going to take a shovel of soil. I'm going to mix it up. Yeah. Throw it back in. Yep. And then water it deeply so that the soil adheres in right next to the yeah, roots. I usually tell people put in about a third of the soil, soak it, put another layer in, soak it. That mm -hmm. way you're sure yeah. everything down at the bottom. And try right. not to leave. It's really important with citrus trees and avocados, but it's true with stone fruits too. Don't leave a well for your fruit trees. The basin. Yeah, don't leave a, a basin. If anything, make it a mound. Mm -hmm. And you could do a berm on the outside, but don't make a well that the water will sit in and stay there. So the berm on the outside is going to keep water from running, running too far away, but the crown of the plant where the where the stem meets the roots, you want that a little elevated yeah. or, or Yeah, we don't want water sitting right next sure. to the trunk. Those trees need oxygen in the soil. Mm. This and is a this is a great mulch. This particular oh, bag great. right here right. is great for mulch. It's organic. You put it right on top and it eventually How works thick. its way uh, you can go three or four inches, wow, okay. but you don't need to. You just be deliberate about doing it every year. Just so you're not seeing the native Yeah, soil. Come, in, come into Paradise Farm and buy this every year. And you put it on. <laughs> no, it's not like that. It's just a... make an investment in your soil. So, last thing before we wrap this up. When should people worry about their fruit trees once they're in the ground? What are some of the signs of things where you may want to not just stand back and let nature take its course? When do you, when the, do you step in? When the you, trees will tell you when you need to worry. Yeah, uh, but if, uh, if, you're, if you don't know what to listen for. Right. <laughs> just know that most of these trees, all of them in fact, are very resilient and they go through cycles. Um, if you get a peach tree that has a lot of fruit on it, but all, but half of the fruit is brown on it, mm -hmm. and it ruins the fruit, that's a problem. Right, but, if but it, how do you know that's but coming? But if it has a couple of leaves out of, of 10,000 that have the leaf curl right. on it, don't spray the tree. Uh -huh. wait, for, wait for nature to kind of have a, have a chance to, to fix it, and because uh, it goes through a cycle, it's gonna lose all its leaves, and if, if it comes back, there's remedies for it. Is there anything I can do that's gentle, that's gonna... Yeah, there's sprays that we have here. Every nursery in town has them. Uh, organic sprays that you just kind of squirt on the aphids and it'll remedy the situation. Okay, and they go to heaven. Yeah. Because they were on a fruit tree, not something nasty. <laughs> yep. Cool, cool. Um, this has been great. I have one more question for you and we're gonna cut and I just want to check with you on this one thing, so stand by. I want to thank you for, for this, and I'll be back thank in you. one second. Um, do you know what variety <laughs> of peach this it's is? A, Which, uh, I want to grow more of these. It's a Jimmy Durante peach. This is a Jimmy Durante. Well played. Not thank not you bad, very right? much. Hi, I'm Mr. Peach, and uh, I don't do ventriloquism very well. Thanks, Patrick, for that delicious information. And if you want to visit Paradise Farm, they're right near Cathedral Oaks and uh, Fairview on Carlo Drive. Or you could just type them into the interwebs and figure out where they are. We're going to be right back. Stay tuned. It's 4 a.m. Do you know what your sprinklers are doing? Broken drip emitter. Gurgling spray head. Broken pipe.
runoff. Check your sprinklers for leaks and repair. Visit waterwisesp.org for more information. When the weather changes, do you know how much water your plants need? For landscaping text alerts, subscribe to the countywide free message service. You'll receive weekly texts with a water percent adjust recommendation to help you conserve water and save money by reducing your watering during cooler weeks. You'll also be notified about upcoming WaterWise classes. A typical seasonal or monthly adjustment isn't precise enough, so you may be overwatering and wasting money. A weekly adjustment is better for the health of your landscape, and it's so simple. Just look for the seasonal adjust, water budget, or percent feature on your irrigation controller. Then select the correct month and finally reduce the percentage based on the recommendation for that week. To sign up for weekly landscape alerts, text WaterWise to 855-510-0241. Hi, welcome back to GardenWise. I'm still Billy Goodnick. I'm gonna take you on a trip in the Wayback Machine to the late 80s when our area was having a very severe drought, brown lawns everywhere, and the really daring people went out and got some gravel or bought three plants and put them in a little triangle in the middle of what used to be their lawn. Well, we're kind of coming back into that again and we're becoming a lot more water-wise. For those of you who are still in love with that idea of a big swath of something green, and you're not ready to revise your entire garden, I've got just the plant for you. It's called Lipia, and it's got a cousin called Carapia. And uh, we're gonna go visit Pat Kelly, former buddy of mine from City of Santa Barbara, and he's gonna show us all about his journey into discovering Lipia. Hi, I am at the lovely, tranquil backyard of Pat Kelly. Pat Kelly and I worked together for years. He was a city engineer when I was working with parks and did a whole bunch of projects together. We did. Skateboard park, big one. Um, anyway, fun. he's got this beautiful Lipia lawn and I am here to grill him and learn more about what it's like to live with Lipia. So, Pat, what, motivate you, what motivated you, what made you say, um, I want to have a Lipia lawn replacement. There was a lawn here, right? Traditional. Yeah, so we landscaped in back in 2009 and put in Marathon. But within a few years uh, with the dogs, it turned into more of a weed patch and eventually a dirt patch because I'm a little bit too cheap to water. Uh huh. And then our daughter is getting married in 2018. Environmentally concerned. That's it. That's it. I'm a tree hugger. Any event. So 2018, uh, big event. Uh, in the family and we wanted to make the yard look a little bit nicer. So we considered the idea of you know putting in Marathon again, putting in what was pretty popular at the time, artificial grass, or take advantage of the city's rebate to put in Carapia or some other um, drought resistant lawn. And you ended up so, going with uh, Lipia slash Carapia. Exactly, very happy about that. It costs less and it's prettier. Cool, and you use somebody else's money for some of it? Well, that was part of the city rebate, right. which has made it cost effective. So uh, we were talking a little earlier, you left the, the majority of the sprinkler system that had been watering the lawn and just adapted it so you could get this off to a good start, the, the sprinkler exactly. system was there? Great. But since then, uh, I'm kind of jumping around here, um, you've told me that it gets very, very little water. Could you talk a little about your watering approach once it got established? Correct. It took a, uh, a lot of water to establish it, just like a lot of natives, a lot of deep watering, so the roots could go really deep. Then, after a few years, I started experimenting with, uh, we chatted about going Darwin on it, and to uh -huh. see how little Survival water, of the fittest. It, see how little water it needed, so I'd only water it when it started getting a little bit crispy. Now I think I'm down to two or three waterings a year uh, for the hot spots, and then in some of the shade spots, maybe just a short amount of hand watering. Wonderful. Whatever's left in your coffee cup, and <laughs> hit a spot there. Um, I, I mean, that's great. That's been my experience talking to other people and seeing them is once you get it started, oh, and I want to circle back to that, then the key is to, to allow the surface soil to get a little bit drier and keep the moisture down low in between watering so that you do get that root system, that 
deep root system anchored. Yeah, I've heard a lot of different things about how deep the roots go, and it's uh, very deep, yeah. from what I understand. And we've had some hot weather, and it's survived it. That's great. Um, prior to putting it in, um, the, the preparation for the area, you took this down to bare dirt to make sure there wasn't any competition of old stuff coming back? Well, it was mostly dirt, but what was left was pretty hardy weeds. And right. So there's um, some, um, had to do some weed killer to prepare the lawn and you go through the process uh, that they recommend to reduce the competition. Right. And after it was installed, kept a little bit eye out for weeds in between the stolons that were planted, but it wasn't that much. Right, you wanna jump on all that stuff early so you've got exactly. somewhere to go with it. And I think it's important as to when you plant it too. You wanna to plant it when it's just about to take off. So you said you, you got to start, the event was in August, yes. and you put it in the ground how soon before that? It was installed, uh, I think, in April, and by the event in November, it was 85 or so, 95% filled in. That's great. So you had an event here. There were people on it. I guess oh, that yeah. would be a little bit scary, the foot traffic and all, but it sounds as if as long as you're not using it as a, a, a polo field or a soccer practice, it can take some traffic. It'll oh, yeah. show, but then it just fills itself back in. Yeah, we've had different yard parties and a couple times a year, in one particular year, and it seemed no worse for wear. That's great. Yeah, um, we, we've shot some footage for some other areas where it's a frequent path, and it just looks different. It's smaller leaves, it's more compacted, but it seems to be tolerating that kind of traffic as well. Um, can you tell me a little bit about what it's like to live with it, what kind of maintenance it needs, how you would compare that to uh, the time and effort you put into a lawn versus what it takes to keep this uh, behaving itself? Because it does have a reputation. Well, uh, less mowing, less water, and as far as cleanup goes, because we live underneath some eucalyptus, um, that at first was a little bit of a challenge as to how to keep it looking good, keep that metal look without looking like it's, you know, living underneath a eucalyptus forest. Mm -hmm. So um, started with, you know, the mowing was the uh, cleanup, then a little bit of raking, and then I came upon just a simple idea of when, um, after a windstorm, pick up the chunks from the eucalyptus and then just get a power um, nozzle. Oh, one of those little spray nozzles that you use just for washing down. Exactly, and then that makes the, the whole environment look very nice. It makes it look like uh, a I'm, meadow again. I'm guessing based on the size of this, you probably go through two or three gallons of water at the most in terms of what comes out of the hose. So it's still, even though you're using water as a tool, it, it, it's pretty thrifty to to just spray uh, a little over the top? Yeah, three to five, depending upon, I'm just thinking in terms of how long it fills, takes me to fill up a five gallon bucket. Right. Um, about about that a time, um, maybe a little bit more, but the water's on the green. Yeah, oh, so it's going back to good use. Um, another thing that I know can be problematic with Lipia, uh, especially if it's happy and the rest of the garden is doing well, is um, you can put in a piece of header board, but it doesn't really care. It laughs exactly. and continues growing. So um, is that a big problem or how do you approach it when it starts creeping where you don't want it? Well, like in the spring, um, at, I wait until it takes off in spring and then I go along the border and just cut it um, along where there's another bed and right now I'm letting it go over the edge of the patio, uh, just kind of soften up the patio yeah, edge. Yeah, it's really just nice. Do a little bit of a clip. So, but it, once a year, probably realistically twice a year, yeah. um, have to look at the edge. Um, well, one other thing though, just to point out, is as Lipia spreads, as long as there's some moisture in the soil, and in most gardens there is, it's also going to root somewhat yes. as it goes. So it's not just a matter of snipping it and taking it off. You'll have to I hoe it zip out. them out a little bit. Or Easiest thing to do, hoe. yeah, is to get uh, a shovel to cut the edge and then just get a hoe and yeah. on your uh, 
um, and, I, and just probably, hoe it up and pick it up on your... Uh, I'd probably be reaching for my flat nose shovel first and you can get under the mulch even without disturbing yeah. it. But that's... It. Okay, so a day, a week, a year in the life is sounds to me like minimal water once it's established. Yes. Um, a little bit of picking through if some new weeds show up, if the birds drop in and winter. something blows in. Yeah. Um, no fertilizer. You know... Um, I just looked up in Sunset Magazine. They said, well, you know, in uh, winter you may want to fertilize it, but, but it's I not... think in the, in the four years I've had it, I fertilized it uh, twice, and I'm wondering if I really even needed to do Probably that. Probably didn't. I mean, it, it's not real demanding in terms of, no. of nurturing. We're not growing no. blueberries here. No. And then, uh, so it'll take some traffic. It's uh, good for entertaining the bees. It does attract some bees, so... Yes. Um, I guess it depends on a person's individual uh, feeling about it, especially if they're allergic to bee stings. This may not be the one for you, but you're pretty successful mowing the majority of the flowers off and, and minimizing that. Like, for example, if we're having a whole bunch of people coming over, um, I'll uh, kind of level it off and get uh, maybe 75% of the flowers off. There's still some flowers left. And um, then just before everybody comes over, I'll pose it to uh, get it wet. And then the bees are gone. Oh. The bees really only come when it's hot. Gotcha. Pat, thank you for uh, opening up your yard to us. It's just beautiful. And I like the fact that we're not going to have to uh, bring in any audio for the bird chirping. <laughs> <laughs> who, who, whoever you uh, assigned to be your bird wrangler. They nailed it. Yeah. Well, good to see it. Good to see it, too. It's great yes. to see okay. it. Um, Carapia, Lipia, great stuff. Good substitute. Big thanks to Pat for taking us through his garden and sharing his experience with Lipia. I hope you'll check it out and maybe consider it for your own garden. Now on to the plant rant. Now, we're not upset about anything. It's not that kind of rant. Uh, in fact, it's quite yummy. We're going back to Paradise Farm. We're meeting with Celeste, and she's going to tell us about her bountiful crop of blueberries and how to grow them at home. It's going to be yummy. Stay tuned. Hi, I'm Celeste Burns from Paradise Farm, and one of my favorite plants is blueberries. The reason I love blueberries is because they make beautiful plants. They also give you a lot of rewards with fruit, and we harvest lots of fruit from our blueberries. The key to successfully growing them, though, is all about the pH of the soil. We have alkaline pH soil, and so we grow ours above ground in these great 24 inch box containers. We have nine of these in our front yard and we are harvesting two bowls of blueberries every evening. These blueberries start in early spring and we're on about the third quarter now um, going into June for their um, fruiting period. So we're really excited about growing blueberries and sharing them with our neighbors, making blueberry jam. We are making blueberry pies. And so blueberries are definitely one of my favorite plants. Um, I brought a jar from home and I just want to touch base a little bit on the importance of soil to grow the blueberries. So we recommend strongly that you use a container to grow your blueberries so you can control the pH of the soil for those berries. They like a 5.5 pH, which is lower than most any other berry that you can grow. And if you put them 100% in acid soil mix, that makes all the difference in the world. And you would feed them with uh, fruit, berry, and vine food. But just harvesting berries every day and being able to eat them, amazing. Thank you, Celeste, for your information and for your enthusiasm. You got me real excited, and now I know what to plant next to my pancake tree. I'll have blueberries and pancakes, yummy. So that's it for this episode. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, it tells us that you're interested in sustainable landscaping, doing something good for your own garden, and doing something good for our community.
If you want to see any past episodes of Garden Wise, you can go to waterwisesb.org. And that's going to do it. Uh, pretty sure I'm still Billy Goodnick, and we'll see you on the next one. Bye-bye.